the Islamic teachings of peace. Salam. I'm going to briefly talk to you about. See, actually, let's be a bit real here. After listening to the Quran, my words will not give the sound and the emotional impact of the Quran any justice. So I'd like to put that premise of my argument today. Because generally, the ascetic reception of the Quran has been something that has resonated throughout history. It has been this invisible hand that has taken souls and given it a good shake. Yeah? This is the impact of the Quran. And hence, after, that's why I always say sometimes, uh, let me go first when I talk, let the Quran go second. Because when the Quran goes first, then how can anything go after the Quran? This is how I feel it. So that's my premise, just to be a bit humble uh, after the recitation of the Quranic discourse. But hence, I'm going to deliver a presentation on why Muslims believe that the Quran is an inimitable text. Why Muslims believe that the Quran is from the divine, and why Muslims believe that the Quran is something special, not just for Muslims, but for the rest of humanity. So the summary of my discussion is as follows. First, I'm going to discuss the nature of the Quran. What is the Quran? Secondly, I'm going to explain the linguistic and literary challenge of the Quran, because inside the Quran, there is a specific challenge. Thirdly, I'm going to discuss that this challenge has something to do with its uniqueness and discuss what makes the Qur'an unique. <laughs> and finally, I'm going to discuss how this uniqueness means that it is from the divine. I'm going to use two approaches, and they're quite philosophical. The first approach is called rational deduction, and the second approach is about the philosophy of miracles, which I'll expound later on. And I will conclude again with some quotes from Western scholarship to show that this is a phenomenon that's not only agreed upon by Eastern scholarship, but also by Western scholarship. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq Read. There's a command here. Read. In the name of your Lord who created. These were the first few words that had a dramatic impact on the world we live in today. These first few words were the paradigm shift. These first few words changed the political and social and economic course of history. Significantly, it changed and it de-scoped the whole of the Arabic literature. This is how powerful these first few words were. For example, the famous popular historian Karen Armstrong states, it is though Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, had created an entirely new literary form. Without this experience of the Quran, it is extremely unlikely that Islam would have taken root. So the Quran was the paradigm shift, especially with regards to the Arabic language. It disculped, it descoped the Arabic language. Further, there was also something special about the Qur'an, because the Qur'an engaged with the inner dispositions of man. The Qur'an engaged with his intellectual capacities and his emotional capacities. Now how does one do this as a human being? Well, let's take psychologists as, a, as an example. I study psychology at university, and I appreciate this quite well. When you sit down with a patient, for example, you ask him or her questions. How are you feeling? What are your perspectives on this issue. Try to engage and impose yourself on the individual and his nafsir, his soul, his spirit, his psychological <laughs> disposition. The Quran does exactly the same thing. Do they not reflect within themselves? There is a question here asking, asking mankind to ponder. The Quran goes even further. Every time it talks about the oneness of the Creator, Ta'id in Arabic, every time it talks about the natural phenomena of the universe, the stars, the moon, the sun, the orbits, the universe, it always ends with a specific psycholinguistic strategy. And what is this? When it talks about these things, it ends with, for those who reflect, for those who know, for those who remember, and for those who use their minds. So the Qur'an attempts to impose itself on humanity. This imposition is not a negative one because it's to agitate the intellectual and emotional capacities of the human being. For example, the Qur'an says, 
Thus, do we explain the signs in detail for those who reflect? And the word here, يتفكرون, is not just pondering or reflecting. It has deeper connotations, multi-layered meanings here, because it's asking you to look at the consequences and the implications on what you're reflecting. Brothers and sisters and friends, the Qur'an also goes further than this. It challenges the whole of mankind with regards to its authorship. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ أَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّنْ مِثْلِ وَدُعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you are in doubt, talking to the whole of humanity here, about that which we have sent down to our Prophet Muhammad, to our slave, to our servant, then bring one single chapter like it. One chapter. And call on your witnesses, supporters, helpers, friends, besides God, besides Allah, if you are indeed sadiqeen, if you are indeed truthful. So there's a challenge here. The Quranic exegetes, those who explain the Quran, such as Ibn Kathir, Jalalain, Ibn Abbas, Qurtubi, and many of the classical scholarship, as well as Western scholarship such as Maghulut and Mir, they have concluded there is ijma'a in Arabic. There is a consensus amongst Western and Eastern scholarship that this challenge has something to do with the special nature of the Arabic language in the Qur'an. There's something special with it. And this also has a historical context. For example, Ibn Rashid, he illustrates how important language was at the time of revelation. He quotes, Whenever a poet emerged in an Arab tribe, other tribes would come to congratulate. Feasts would be prepared, the women would join together on lutes as they do at weddings, and the old and young men would all rejoice at the good news. The Arabs used to congratulate each other only on the birth of a child and when a poet rose among them. Now, the challenge was for the whole of humanity and it's a timeless challenge. Al-Nab'a'udim, a timeless, eternal challenge. But it was also specific for those who were Arabic linguists par excellence. And those Arab linguists par excellence were the people at the time of Revelation. Because the people, the Quraysh, the Arabs at the time of Revelation, were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic language. But they failed to challenge the Quran. And this resonates in the following statement from Forster Fitzgerald Arbuthnot, who was a notable British Orientalist and translator. He states, And though several attempts have been made to produce a work equal to it, as far as elegant writing is concerned, none has yet succeeded. So what makes the Qur'an so special? What makes the language of the Qur'an so special? Well, there are four major arguments, and they are as follows. The first one is the unique literary form of the Qur'an, which I'll expound later on. Second is the unique genre of the Qur'an. The third is the eloquence, the matchless eloquence of the Qur'an. And fourth, is the Qur'an has an abundance of rhetorical features, rhetorical devices. In the Islamic Arabic tradition, rhetoric means language that intends to please and persuade. So let me quickly summarize these arguments and expound on one of them, which is the unique literary form. Now, with regards to the unique literary form, which I'll explain in detail later, the Qur'an cannot be described as any of the known forms of the Arabic language. The second argument, the unique linguistic genre, is based on modern linguistic studies <coughs> from scholars such as Abdul Halim and Abdul Rauf and many Western scholars such as Neil Robinson. And it goes like this. Every Quranic verse and sentence uniquely marries rhetorical features and cohesive features of language in such a way that if you were to strip them apart or divorce them from each other, it would cease to sound like the Qur'an. It would cease to sound like the Qur'an. The third argument, eloquence. The Qur'an is a peak of eloquence. Why do scholars say this? Because every word that is chosen is perfect. Not only because of the sounds that you hear, but of the communicative effect, the meaning that it tends to portray. An example is, 
one of the shortest surahs of the Qur'an. It goes, the first verse, this is a quick example, إِنَّ أَطَعِنَا كَالْكَوْثَرِ Verily, undoubtedly, we have given you the abundance. Talking to the Prophet Muhammad here. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's take one word to show very quickly and superficially how superior eloquence just this verse is. The word we have given you, Atayna, if you were to find any other word in any of the classical dictionaries, you could not find a better word with its semantic value. Why do I say this? Because this word is the only word that has two added connotations. And what are these connotations? It is to give the thing with your own hand, and the thing that you are giving, you actually own. And surely God wants to show to the Prophet Muhammad here with surety that he has given the Prophet abundance, and that thing is actually the thing that God owns. So just as a superficial example, not even scratching the surface, but just to show, if you were to compare even one word with any word in the classical dictionaries of the Arabic language, we could not find a better word. The fourth argument is the abundance of rhetorical features, the abundance of rhetorical devices. The Qur'an can only be described as a sea of rhetoric. And this is concluded by Western and Eastern scholarship again, such as Neil Robinson, <coughs> Anthony Johns, Marbil Mir, Arbery, Abdul Halim, Abdul Rauf, and many others. Some of these rhetorical features and devices include analogy, alliteration, antiphrasis, antithesis, assonance, cadence, hyperlo, hyper, hyperbole, isocolon, metaphor, parenthesis, polyton, rhetorical questions, stress, and many others. There's a whole list. And the argument is that no other text, the size of the Qur'an, past or present in the Arabic language, has that many rhetorical features. So let me discuss in a bit more detail one of the arguments I've summarized now. And I'm going to use the unique literary form. The reason I'm doing this is because the unique literary form is an objective argument. It doesn't really have anything to do with the aesthetic reception. For example, many here love Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare. Much of its poetry and its prose is quite inspiring. However, that doesn't mean anything because it's quite a subjective argument. It's not based upon something that's based upon observable phenomena that we can all agree on. Whereas the unique literary form argument is based upon the mechanics of the language. We cannot disagree if it is a certain form or not. Whereas with Shakespeare, we can say, well, that was actually written by Christopher Marlowe, which I don't know if many of you study English literature, but that debate is even still going on today. So the unique literary form of the Quran. Taha Hussein, a prominent Egyptian literature, during the course of a public lecture, summarized how the Quran achieved this unique literary form. He said, But you know that the Quran is not prose, and it is not verse either. It is rather Quran, and it cannot be called by any other name but this. It is not verse, and that is clear, for it does not bind itself to the bonds of verse. And it is not prose, for it is bound by bonds peculiar to itself, not found elsewhere. The Arabic language, with regards to literary forms, can be summarized as follows. You have poetry and you have prose. Poetry is very rhythmical, very metrical. Why do I say this? Because every line has to end with a rhyme. And within that verse, it has to conform strictly or loosely to 16 rhythmical patterns. In the Arabic language, it's called al-bihar, coming from the word bahar, which means seas. So you can see like there's a rhythm as the waves move. So poetry is defined as such. It ends with a rhyme, and it adheres to 16 rhythmical patterns, which are syllabic rhythmical patterns, based upon the syllables of the verse or the poem. And also, I said we have prose. Now, prose can be further categorized in two forms of speech, sajaa and mursal. Sajaa is rhyme prose. 
Now, rank clause in Arabic language is quite peculiar because it's not metrical, but it does have a rhythmical pattern. And that rhythmical pattern is based upon not syllables, but accent. For example, many of you may know this. Uh, an example of accent based rhythmical patterns can be found in nursery rhymes. Ba, ba, black sheep, have you any more? <laughs> so it's not based upon the number of syllables, but based upon the accents. And also, it ends with a rhyme. So there's two definitions here so far. It has an accent-based rhythmical pattern. It ends with a rhyme. And also, Sajid is always seen to have a concentrated use of rhetorical features. For example, David J. Stewart in the Encyclopedia of the Quran highlights this feature of Sajid He says, in addition, Sajid regularly involves the concentrated use of syntactic and semantic parallelism, alliteration, paranomasia, and other rhetorical features. Now I also mention Mursal as a form of prose. Mursal is very simple. It's exactly the way I am speaking to you today. Straightforward speech. No rhyme, no rhythm, nothing. Just normal Hamza. Yeah? <laughs> so, is the Quran poetry? Well, the Quran cannot be poetry because if you were to scan the totality of every surah, which is the chapter of the Qur'an, from the smallest to the largest, we can see that by definition it cannot be poetry. It does end with a rhyme, sometimes an irregular rhyme, and sometimes it has a tendency to monorhyme, but its rhythmical pattern does not adhere to any of the al-bihar which I mentioned before, the poetic syllabic rhythmical patterns. So by definition, it cannot be poetry. Muhammad Khalifa, in his article, The Authorship of the Qur'an, correctly concludes, Readers familiar with Arabic poetry realize that it has long been distinguished by its wazan, bahar, arud, and qafiya, exact measures of syllabic sounds and rhymes, which have to be strictly adhered to even at the expense of grammar and shade of meaning at times. All this is categorically different from the Qur'anic literary style. So the Qur'an is not poetry. Now, is it rhyme prose? Is it sajaa? Well, there's three reasons why it cannot be sajaa. The first reason is because the Qur'an uniquely fuses metrical and non-metrical speech together in such a way that we cannot see the deviations in style. A good example is to read chapter 12, Surah Yusuf. And this is concluded by the famous Arabist and Orientalist <coughs> Abru. He states, for the Qur'an is neither prose nor poetry, but a unique fusion of both. The other aspect of why the Qur'an cannot be called rhyme prose or sajaa is because it is its own form of rhyme prose, which many Orientalists and Arabists call Qur'anic sajaa. And the reason it's its own form of rhyme prose is because it has a greater tendency to monorhyme, whereas normal sajaa has more varied rhymes. For example, one study states that over 50% of the Qur'an ends with the letter noon, the equivalent in English <coughs> N, which any other size text, Arabic text, with that kind of information has never ended with that frequency with just one letter. Also, the Qur'an has inexact rhyme, which differs from normal rhyme prose. And it has greater range of phrases, short and small, interlinked. And it has a high frequency of rhetorical features as discussed. Because one of the definitions of sajaa is also that it has a concentrated use of rhetorical features, whereas the Qur'an surpasses this, it transcends that type of frequency to a frequency unknown to any other text. Devin J. Stewart, who is the only Western scholar to discuss the literary form of the Qur'an and highlight the formal differences between sajaa and what he calls Quranic Sajaa concludes the analysis undertaken in the study makes possible some preliminary observations on the formal differences between Quranic Sajaa. Now the final aspect of why the Quran cannot be called rhyme prose is because the Quran has its own stylistic variations. Theologians and Arabists such as Al-Ashari, Al-Rumani, Al-Baqilani said that the Quran cannot be any type of literary form because it uniquely evolves and molds together different aspects of language. 
that they called stylistic variations. For example, uh, S. Hajaji Jadwa in her article, The Enchantment of Reading, Sound, Meaning, Expression in Surah al adiyat which discusses how the Qur'an achieves its uniqueness due to stylistic differences, states, Qur'anic Arabiya brings forth a dazzling assembly of word, meaning and sound, defying the conventions of both the Arabian Sajia and literary rules of classical Arabic literature. So the Qur'an also has its own unique stylistic variations. Now is it mutsal? Is it straightforward speech? Well we know this is not the case because the Qur'an, as discussed, does have rhyme, in exact rhyme, and its own internal rhythm, if you like, and its own use of stylistic features, which mursal is not defined as that, it's defined as normal speech. So the Qur'an is unique. Western, Eastern scholarship concludes that it's unique. It has its own unique literary form. But show us Shakespeare, surely. Shakespeare was unique. But I disagree. Shakespeare, you see, was unique in his use of trying to attract the attention and deliver a message, whether it's one of play, whether it's one of love, hatred, war, violence, confusion. But that aesthetic reception sat in the iambic pentameter. And the iambic pentameter was used and can be used by many who know the English language. But the Quran, its style, its stylistic variation, its aesthetic reception has its own form which no one has even created or used. So how does it make it from the divine? How does the uniqueness of the Quran render it a miracle? How does the uniqueness of the Quran mean that it is from Allah or from God. But well, I'm going to use two approaches here. The first approach is called rational deduction and the second is on the philosophy of miracles. Now, let's talk about the first one. What is rational deduction? Well, simply rational deduction is a thinking process starting with one universally accepted statement that no one can doubt and from it drawing logical conclusions. So with regards to the Quran, what is the universally accepted statement? Well, according to Margulith, Mir, Arbery, Anthony Johns, and many other scholars, the statement is as follows. The Arabs at the time of, of revelation were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic language. They were Arabic linguists par excellence. So what does this mean? Well, let's talk about the logical conclusions. If they failed to challenge the Quran, then who is the author of the Quran? And let's follow logically some of the steps. First, cannot be an Arab because the best placed people who could challenge the Quran failed. So you can't really be an Arab. We can't find a comprehensive answer here when they all have failed to challenge the Quran. Secondly, can it be from a non-Arab? Well, you have to know the Arabic language to challenge the Quran. So who's next? Some may quickly jump and say it's God, therefore it must be God. You know, logical conclusion states it must be from the creator. If you can't be from Arab or non-Arab, you can't be from man. Some might say, well, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was a genius. It must be from him. But there's some arguments here. It's not very coherent. The reason being is because the Prophet Muhammad was an Arab himself. And surely, with human expression, when someone expresses himself in a certain structure, style or form, it can be emulated. For example, in art, there's this form of art called post-impressionism. Someone developed it, it looked nice, it was awe-inspiring, but the blueprint was there to copy. Hence, we have the form called post-impressionism. But the Quran cannot be replicated. But with human expression, it can be replicated. Specifically, if we have the blueprint of that expression, and we have the blueprint of the Qur'an today. Secondly, the literary character of the Qur'an is quite fascinating. Because the Prophet Muhammad, well known in his seerah, which is the life of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he went through trials and tribulations. He lost his wife, his child, 
He was boycotted, tortured, his companions were killed. But yet the Qur'an does not express any of that emotion. He expresses the Qur'anic emotion. He doesn't express the emotion of a single human being. Rather, it consoles the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So the literary character of the Qur'an is not that of a man who went through all of these difficulties in life. Also, we have hadith which are narrations attributed to the Prophet Muhammad but in a totally different style to the Qur'an. They are antithetical to the style of the Qur'an. And according to psychology research of uh, oral expression, it is physiologically and psychologically impossible to utter two distinct styles orally over a 23 year period and the Qur'an was revealed over a 23 year period. This is impossible. Another aspect why it can't be from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessed be upon him, is because the Qur'an is a literary masterpiece. We know this. Martin Zamet, a Dutch professor on Arabic language says, the Qur'an is the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. Now with all literary masterpieces though, they take time, effort, struggle, soul searching, revision, addition, and sometimes intellectual speculation. But the Qur'an many times was revealed instantaneously and yet remained in the form of a literary masterpiece. So there is no naturalistic explanation here. It could not have been from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So the logical conclusion follows that it must have come from the Creator if you believe the Creator exists, which is a prerequisite. So this is the rational deduction argument. And it doesn't require for you to know any word of the Arabic language. You just have to accept there's a universally accepted statement that the Arabs at the time of revelation who were Arab linguists par excellence could not challenge the Qur'an successfully. Now, the philosophy of miracles. Generally speaking, in the philosophy of miracles, we have an understanding in the popular culture that a miracle, if we believe in one, is something that transcends <coughs> universal patterns. For example, if we take orbits, we know orbits that go around the sun, like the earth and other celestial spheres, they go in a certain shape. We've seen that for millennia and years. But all of a sudden, we develop a microscope, a more powerful one, not a microscope, rather a telescope, <laughs> and we see Pluto, but it has a bit of an anomalous orbit. Surely that must be a miracle because it transcends the patterns we've been seeing for centuries. No. This is logically incoherent. Why do I say this? It's because if Pluto has done this, then it's part of the pattern now. So it can't be a miracle by definition. So the modern, more logically coherent definition of a miracle, as proclaimed by Western philosophers like William Lane Craig, are acts of impossibilities. As he puts it, events which lie outside the productive capacity of nature. So we say as Muslims, the Qur'an is an event that lies outside the productive capacity of the nature of the Arabic language. Because when we go to see the nature of the Arabic language, the finite 28 letters, the finite grammatical rules, and we use all the possible combinations to try and express something like the Qur'an, with regards to its literary form, we fail. So we've gone to the nature of the Arabic language, and we cannot find a natural link to the Qur'an itself. So the only thing we can conclude is that there must be a supernatural explanation. It's an impossibility based upon what we know about the nature of the Arabic language itself. It's the equivalent of getting a cup, taking the hand away, handle away from the cup's base, putting it back together, and this is something that I made earlier, <laughs> and creating a mobile phone. Impossible, because the nature of the cup is ceramic. But we know ceramic cannot make metal, or the buttons, or make it go light and flashy, and whatever the case may be. So the nature of the cup, of the material of the cup, cannot explain what it just created. Therefore, there's no naturalistic, comprehensive explanation. So logically, the Qur'an, is a miracle because it goes 
beyond any natural explanation and it is an event that lies outside the productive capacity of nature and with regards to the Arabic language it transcends any of the natural expressions of the Arabic language and when we go and we see the tools in place, the 28 letters and the grammatical particles and the grammatical rules when we put them in combination and we exhaust all combinations and yet we still don't have the Quran then we cannot explain it by the Arabic language itself we have to explain it by other means and hence by definition it's an impossibility therefore it's a miracle and let me conclude with some western scholarship the highly acclaimed professor and Arabist Hamilton Gibbs states the Meccans still demanded of him a miracle and with remarkable boldness and self-confidence Muhammad appealed as a supreme confirmation of his mission to the Quran itself like all Arabs they were connoisseurs of the language and rhetoric. Well, then if the Qur'an were his own composition, other men could rival it. Let them produce ten verses like it. If they could not, and it is obvious that they could not, let them accept the Qur'an as an astounding evidential miracle. Paul Casanova, in April 1909, at the College of France said, Whenever Muhammad was asked a miracle as a proof of the authenticity of his mission, he quoted the composition of the Qur'an and its incomparable excellence as proof of its divine origin. And in fact, even for those who are non-Muslims, nothing is more marvelous than its language with such apprehensible plenitude and a grasping sonority. The ampleness of its syllables, with the grandiose cadence, and with a remarkable rhythm, have been of much moment in the conversion of the most hostile and the most skeptic. Professor Bruce Lawrence of Duke University correctly asserts, as tangible signs, Quranic verses are expressive of an inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, layered with meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. And there's more, one of my favorites, Reverend R. Bosworth Smith. He concludes that the Quran in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, is a miracle of purity of style, of wisdom and of truth. It is the one miracle claimed by Muhammad, his standing miracle, and a miracle Indeed, it is. However, the Quran is not just a literary masterpiece, it has this message for mankind. And logically, if it is a miracle and we can prove its authenticity via its aesthetic reception, via its unique literature, then surely its message must also be true because it's from the divine. Its language is so unique and powerful that Kenneth Cragg also. I believe from Oxford University, mentioned that in order for humanity to deal with the challenges it faces today, and he says, multitudes of mankind will need to be guided and persuaded Quranically. Jazakallah for listening. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you very much for listening. And all praises unquestionably indeed are due to the Creator, the Lord of the Universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God. Exalted is he. Thank you for your patience.